I was walking through the mall maybe five years ago and someone said, Mrs. Wagner. And this young girl came running up to me and she said, do you remember me? And I said, oh, you look, you know, young, young grown up woman now. She said, you taught a lesson on Frank Lloyd Wright. Do you remember that lesson? She said, I am in architecture school because of you. See, there it is. That meant the world to me. I don't know how to turn the phone off on this, but I don't know if it rings. I think it just vibrates. <laughs> well, we're going to find out. <clears throat> we're going to find out. Yeah, Shirley Wagner's in here, and we may have a phone incident off her iPhone on her wrist, which I have never had because right. we're older and we don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> what do you do at night? I put it in another room. You just take it just off and put it, it in another room? Charge in another space. You know, that's how we all deal with technology at a certain age. I think we just go, okay, we, we don't really know how to deal with this. We'll just put it away. Or, we'll or just unplug turn it. it off. Unplug it and it'll reset and it'll be all fixed. Yeah, it's like my, I hate to even admit this because I'm pretty technologically uh, up there. But my phone, my cell phone is like, I got a new cell phone. It's not hooked up to my car remotely, mm -hmm. Bluetooth, and I haven't bothered to do it. It's easier just to go speaker. True. Because <laughs> I have to go read how to do it. I have to figure out how to do it because I only do it maybe once every three years or two years. So, yeah. But here we are using technology to discuss your life. We need it. You know, It becomes more and more important as time goes on, and I'm feeling more comfortable using it in my own work and planning and uh, writing about it and thinking about it and then getting someone help me interpret that all. Yeah. With the, with the and do you use technology much actually? Um, I do. Um, in limited quantities, uh, I can articulate what I'm thinking, uh, but I need to have someone put it on the computer screen for me. Mm -hmm. And then we move shapes around mm. or we experiment with colors. Oftentimes I'll produce a work in bare wood and then colorize it on the computer. Mm, makes and sense. It's, you know, it's a lot easier to make those mistakes uh, before you bring out the compressor and spray it down. Well, yeah. I think it makes, a, I think it totally makes sense because you work in all these geometric forms. Mm -hmm. So that to me seems like that would be the ideal media to be able to manipulate and to get the ideas that you want. Yeah. And to make mistakes along the way uh, as you're dragging something across the screen and suddenly, wow, <laughs> something you never thought about. Right. A lot easier than having already manufactured it or cut the wood or the right. metal. <laughs> right. so true. Yeah. So we just kind of blow, drew, you know, grabbed into this conversation. But where where did you come from? I don't know the backstory. I mean, okay. I represent you as an artist, and I know some of the things about art school and stuff, but I don't really know you. Well, I'm a Midwest girl. I was born in Youngstown, Ohio. Yeah, that's really Midwest. Yeah, that's in the northeast corner of the state. And uh, a lot about what I want to talk about with you today probably started right there in my childhood. I think that's true for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, what were your folks, what did they do in Youngstown? My father was an attorney mm -hmm. and my mother was a stay at home mother uh, who had a passion for art, mm. uh, dabbled in art a bit, but encouraged me very much. And we had wonderful conversations about art. Mm -hmm. uh, so that got the juices flowing. Do you think she wanted to be an artist, but was in that Kind of 40s, 50s time frame where totally. she couldn't really pursue her right. dreams. Right. So she allowed her daughter to be that person maybe for her in some yes. way. Yes. Yes. I think you're right. Yeah. And did you have siblings? I have uh, a sister mm -hmm. and a brother and uh, they both still live in the Midwest. And did they go into the arts at all? No. Not at no. all? No. They were, they were no. different. Each child picks their own little area <laughs> of expertise, and then you don't go yeah. into someone else's territory. Yeah. So you kind of grow up in the, as a kid in the 60s, mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when did you first realize that you had a penchant for art? Well, this goes back a little bit, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, I'm of Romanian heritage. And uh, my parents both 
uh, were first generation Americans. And were they born in America? They were born in yeah. America, yes. But their grandparents, both sides, immigrated? That's correct, from Romania. And was that in like the teens time frame? That was in the early teens, like around 1915, something like yeah. that. Um, grandparents on both sides came to uh, find a new life here. Uh, they didn't plan on staying. Uh, they just came because there were jobs, mm -hmm. coal jobs, um, jobs with rich um, minerals and the rich um, ore that was in Ohio, uh, but they ended up liking it and they stayed. Mm. So um, the point I, I want to make is that my Romanian heritage played a big part in my um, where I am today. In what respect? Well, there were communities in Youngstown, Ohio of uh, different ethnic groups, Italians, Poles, English, Romanians, mm -hmm. um, and they lived in little communities. And the church was uh, a, a uniting factor, and so they brought their churches here. And as a young girl, I went to church every day, uh, every Sunday with my parents. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at this church every Sunday and admiring the building. And after years of looking at that building, I realized, yeah, I do like architecture. Mm. Then going inside the church was a whole other experience. To go into an Orthodox church um, is a sight to behold. It's, um, it was beautiful to me. And so, ornate, right? Ornate, yeah. totally. They are. Full of symbolism, full of uh, detail, full of relief. And so all those years, me going on Sundays, often hated going and be sitting there, but I'd be looking at this altar. And uh, I admired the painting. I admired the carving, the forging. And one day it occurred to me that some artist made all these things. Do you know how old you were when you had that revelation? Um, probably a little bit older, probably, well, about 12 or 14 or yeah. something like that. But uh, I was, you know, really starting to enjoy drawing and, and uh, my mother encouraged me so much. And so I started making these connections and that, um, yeah, an artist made those things. And then I started looking at the altar in a totally different way, I would, first of all, I, I looked at the symmetry of the altar. But then I started playing around with the symmetry. And what if I took that group of shapes and put them over there and rearranged this whole composition? And now look at these things are closer. So these are in the foreground. And then there's a middle ground and, and that heaven back there with the sky is the background. And so I, I really started digging middle ground, foreground, background, composition, form, shapes. It, it, it really, I, I, I'm sure that that's where this whole thing started with me. And it wasn't that you just had a, a very boring pasture and then he allowed oh, you I'm... to <laughs> spend time doing this? Um, well, you know, the, the Orthodox services were three hours long. And ah. Lots of time you spent on your feet. Yeah. Now, I might add, it helped that I spoke Romanian. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you that yes, question. Yes, I do speak. Not as well as, as um, I could, but if I were to practice and if I go when I go to Romania... I do pretty good for myself. But yeah. anyway, those early years really informed. Uh, and you have to wonder, I mean, three hours long, there is a reason to let your mind think and go different places, especially as a kid. That's right. You know, uh, how you, know, you, I think it's a natural that, and almost a great thing that you have this opportunity to focus on other things that you might normally not do as a mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. you, you're kind of forced. It's almost yes. like a piano lesson. Yes, that's true. Way. Uh, but, you know, what you learn first stays with you. And yeah, that's true. Kind of did. Hey, I remember being in our um, 
little town where I grew up in New Mexico. Okay. And there was a big theater, a huge one of these old timey theaters. It's the only one in town. And in it, they had huge WPA murals. And they were of Western scenes, these big, you know, dramatic, you know, bigger than life, you know, wagons and cowboys and all that kind of stuff. And I remember sitting in there and looking at them all the time when I would go to the show before I, I'd get there and just sit around and watch and yeah. look at those murals. They're on both sides of the theater. Mm -hmm. And they were probably 40 by 80 feet. I mean, they were huge. Yeah. And uh, so I think those things, and I didn't ever put that together. No. But later it's like, oh, I wonder That's if right. that had a effect because I wasn't noticing the art. I was paying attention. I wasn't just, you know, looking at the girls in front of me. I was actually <laughs> looking at the sides of the thing. And there wasn't a lot of art where I grew up. So to see art was actually something that was unusual in the yes. eastern New Mexico. They didn't yes. have much. So I think those early things do can have effects that we don't mm -hmm. realize, mm -hmm. which is why I think primary school for art is so important. Do you remember when you first were kind of maybe recognized? Were you recognized in school for your artistic ability? I was. Um, a couple times um, you would find in a magazine, draw this. And you would draw it and send it in. Right, I remember <clears> this. And so I would draw that all the time. And uh, my parents would get calls, oh, your daughter, she's got some talent. And then you know, I remember after a period of time thinking, maybe I, maybe I am good at something. And it was just, you know, taking a pencil and, and reproducing what I saw. But I guess I did an okay job with it. Um, and then my mother enrolled me into some uh, art classes at the university. I'm sorry, at the local um, uh, museum. And um, it was interesting because it was a landscape uh, painting class. Mm -hmm. And again, there was that background, middle ground, foreground. And I remember wanting to uh, not let all of those grounds blend into each other, but I wanted to make each one a little more distinct mm. again. Um, Makes sense when you see your sculptures, especially. Yes, yes. They're all layered. Yes. I wish I would have <laughs> had more art in school. Um, I, I did have one, an interesting experience when I was in high school. I um, So girls take home ec. Yeah. Okay. What well, years I, was this? Is it like early 60s? Early 60s. Yeah. Yes. I really wanted to take shop classes, but I wasn't allowed. Oh. I had to take home ec. And you but tried I, to take the shop and they just said Well, they no. wouldn't even consider it. Yeah, yeah, no, girls have to take home ec. But I wanted to learn how to cut wood and, and to use some power tools. Um, and as we go on in this conversation, I'll tell you how I ended up learning power tools myself. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so I had to take home ec. And we had to make a gingham apron. Yeah. And then we had to take rickrack. And th th this teacher was very strict about you have to take the rickrack, put it around the edges of the apron and the pocket. And no, yours is crooked and this and that. All right. So I, I, I was very frustrated that I did it. And then when I came home, I took a pair of scissors and I snipped along the bottom of the apron and I tore each piece into shreds. <laughs> so it was all. It was much more interesting to me, and I put it on the wall. And I said, "Now there we go. There's my art." After you got your grade, after oh yeah, got... yeah, she had no idea. No, <laughs> took that apron home. I was never going to use it. You I, still have it by any chance? I wish I did. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? I wish I did. So you were forced to do that. Yes. And but you, when you you graduate, what time? When did you graduate? I graduated from high school in 1968. Yeah. Oh, so the yes. height of the Vietnam War. That's correct. Yeah. And how was that affecting mm. your life too? Because there was a lot going on. Very interesting. So, Youngstown was a big steel producing town, um, and um, car manufacturer. Mm. And in those late. 68, 69, a lot of young men I went to school with were, wanted to work in the mills because that's where the money was. Yeah, they pay well. Right. Still do. They still do. And uh, so they, for, they, they eliminated, they did not go to college. They went to the mills and, and to the car manufacturer and had these jobs. Then they got drafted. In Vietnam. Yeah, because they didn't have a college deferment. That's correct. And so it created this culture of um, mediocrity. 
and uh, I didn't like what I saw. I didn't. I didn't. Didn't feel that I was stimulated enough as an artist. But it definitely had a profound effect on uh, people that I went to school with. And right around that time was the Kent State Massacre. Yeah. I uh, Were you still in Ohio when that happened? I was happened? still in Ohio. Um, I went to high school with one of the girls that was uh, killed that day. Are you kidding? Yeah. Wow. Because there's what, really? four killed or something? There were four girls. Her name was um, Kathleen Sh something Scherer. Sure, or something like and that. And she was one of the people she was that one was of the four protesters that was, that was killed. No, she was actually just walking she across would... campus. Wow. And senselessly uh, killed. Yeah. And what was your take of the Vietnam War at that point in time? At the time, um, I supported us being there. And then, as most of us changed our uh, thoughts as years went on, uh, I was a little naive. My parents perhaps sheltered me too much. Mm. And uh, I just wanted to express myself with my art. So um, I didn't have a strong opinion as, as others did. My parents sheltered me quite a bit. Yeah. So I'll years. take it in 69, you didn't go to Woodstock then? I did not go to Woodstock. <laughs> um, I listened to Jimi Hendrix in my bedroom and my father went crazy. What kind of music is that? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. And so you went to art school from I did. from high school. Yes. And was your your mom happy and your dad not, or what did it, what was their take on you going into art school? Oh, my mother was ecstatic. Uh, so I went to Youngstown State University. Uh huh. Uh, but on the suggestion of my father, I he said, get a good job, become a teacher, get an English get become an English teacher. Mm -hmm. So. I uh, declared my major as English and went through the first year, and I knew I did not want to uh, become an English teacher. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> so one day I remember I was on campus. It was pouring rain. I went into a phone booth and I called my advisor and I said, "I'm switching my degree to studio art." And um, I told my mother, and she was very happy and encouraging. My father had a hard time, but as he saw how happy I was, and as he started to see some of my work, he gradually came around and accepted it. Uh, he actually wanted me to be a lawyer when he realized <clears throat> that was going nowhere. English was the second best. So he said, I don't know how you're going to make it a living uh, <laughs> making art, but you know, you figure it out. You know, it was it was different for women back then, for sure. Yeah, and of course, he's a first generation immigrant. That's right. His parents went through the depression. He probably went through part of it himself. He did. And uh, you know, he was afraid for you. He was. He was. But your mom probably had the push. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you switched to studio art. That's correct. And then, did you do that? Did you get your degree? I did from get my there? degree. Um, yeah, so I, I studied uh, painting and uh, drawing, but my favorite classes were sculpture. Mm. So I took as many sculptural classes as I could, uh, and drawing, I enjoyed drawing as well. Mm. Um, you just immediately gravitated immediately, to sculpture. I mean, I've always been drawn to dimensional work, and it goes back to those times, I think, when I was going to church and I was seeing, you know, all that, that oh. relief and texture and... I was going to take it and, and make it mine and take it into my own realm. Unfortunately, my mother died the day before I graduated from mm. uh, art school. That was an unplanned event. Unplanned. And um, I had a nine-year-old brother, mm. and I had wanted to go to graduate, graduate school. school. I really wanted to try to get into Cranbrook in Michigan, but I... My whole life changed, and I stayed home and helped raise my brother. Wow. And how long yeah. did you do that for? Uh, for about five years. So you're 21, yeah. from 21 to 26, yeah. Yeah. you go home. It and was devastating. Our mother was the nucleus of the family, yeah. and I just had to. Uh, and you had another sibling, and right? And I had another sister, too. And how and old was she? She was uh, two years younger than I was. Yeah, so yeah. you had to go and kind of fill in for her. A little bit, Yeah. 
So, what was that like? Uh, and what did you do for tough, those five? Mark. Yeah, those was, five years. Mm. What did you do? So, um, I got a job at a store called Livingston's as I, the fashion. Did you hear of Livingston's? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, as the fashion coordinator and in charge of all display and uh, some advertising. And so I was bec I was creative in a way. Uh, I had always a good sense of style and fashion, etc. And um, so I did that for a while. And then there was a, a, a big department store across the street uh, that was affiliated with the May Company. And they brought me there as a buyer mm. for designer sportswear. I mean, I had no retail experience. <laughs> and suddenly <laughs> I'm in the Escada showroom in New York City and saying, I'll take one of these and one of those. I mean, it was wild. Yeah. But they trusted my uh, eye. And uh, I couldn't keep my numbers straight. I had an assistant who did all the math for me because math is not, it's still not my best <laughs> yeah. subject. But um, yeah, that's how I, um, I, I spent those years. And then I married my husband. And when I moved, we lived in, he was in New York. I moved to New York and uh, the May Company transferred me to their corporate offices in New York. And how old were you when you got married? 30 years old. Yeah, so you were actually older yes. from that time frame. That's correct. You, you definitely were. That's right. Yeah. Quite a bit older. And yeah. so, and he was in medical school at that time? My husband, Marius, was completing his fellowship in New York City in cardiology. Mm. Uh, he was a Romanian, Romanian German. First generation as well? Um, he was. He came from Romania and emigrated to the United States. Yes, first generation in 1973. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. I wasn't looking to marry a <laughs> Romanian guy. I mean, how far do you want to carry this? Um, but it was a blind date, and uh, yeah, I, and, I was. I got out of Youngstown and headed to the big city. Yeah. So as soon as you could get your kid, your your moms and your siblings yes. on their own, you were able to go to New York and, and you were doing buying for fashion for, yeah, I was, was actually, it for Macy's? It was for the May Company oh, and May it, Company. I was considered a resident buyer. In other words, I would not buy, I would represent a group of stores in New York City on 7th Avenue and I would go out into the market and I, I would identify trends, colors, styles, and uh, generate these reports back to... How do you um, do that? Do you? I mean, do you hit the streets? You literally <clears> hit <throat> the streets. Every day of your life, you hit the streets and you look to see what the designers are doing. Uh, you look for common threads that uh, you can see. And you, you because I had this experience in uh, Ohio with buying, I was more respected because I'd actually worked in the field. Um, and so, you know, I, I wrote these wonderful elaborate reports and uh, I was doing very well for myself. So you're um, a, you were a, <clears throat> a social connector, really, basically. You're looking at trends that are going on and what's right. going to be hot, right? That's right. <clears throat> that's right. And hemlines, you know, and then, <clears throat> you know, if something happened like uh, Princess Diana got married, now all of a sudden, you know, how is her style sensibility affecting? You know, definitely uh, moving away from my art making, but still creative. Oh, yeah, that, that creative still is, for sure. In, in a different way. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And what did you, did, did you enjoy that job, by the way? Um, I did, and I was, I was going places with it. Um, and then I got pregnant. And my husband had finished his training, and uh, we decided that New York was not going to be the best place. And this was New York City, it. right? That's correct. Um, it was Brooklyn. Yeah. 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 It's awesome. And, <laughs> and so then you... Some great years. So you go, okay, where do you go? Yeah. So uh, it was pretty marketable. Yeah, and, I'm sure he uh, was very marketable, yeah. right? And... Um, <clears throat> We moved to Tucson in 1983, and he... Uh, Why Tucson? Well... That's we, where the job was? Well, no, more than that. Uh, we liked the, the fact that there was a strong presence of the university. We wanted a university mm -hmm. town. We wanted that higher level of, of uh, aesthetics and understanding 
um, that a town like Tucson could provide us. Uh, but my husband was a cardiologist and there was a strong retirement community here. And um, so we tried it for one year and uh, we realized it was going to be just the best place for him, mm -hmm. he and I to live, uh, to raise a family. And uh, so in three years, I had three kids. Hmm. Like one, two, three? Boom, like boom, one, boom. two, three. Uh, when the oldest was three and a half, I had a two, two and a half year old and a newborn. So, and so you just basically said, okay, I'm not doing this as my career. Yeah. And I'm just going to now focus on this. And you flipped the switch and said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, I could see it like and, that. I don't know if that's uh, how it happened. It, it but. did. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes those brave, those brave moves are good because uh, I use it now in my own art making. I just turn things upside down sometimes and. You learn a lot from those experiences. Were you still making art at this time frame? I was drawing a lot, but um, missing missing my studio practice. Mm -hmm. um, but things have a way of working out. I, um, when my youngest was about five years old, his teacher in elementary school heard that Mrs. Wagner has a degree in art uh -huh. yeah. and asked me if I'd like to be the art mom for his class. Right. Okay. So I think I put together something pretty sophisticated that uh, had a little bit to do with math and a little bit to do with art. And I came up with some project. I, I wish I, I had it with, I, I would love to see it, what I did then. Anyway, put it in the hallways at the school. And this was uh, for Tendler Elementary at Tucson Unified School District. And people from the district would come to visit the school and somebody from the art department said, who did that? We want to meet her. So to make a long story short, I uh, was hired as an artist for the district to create art lessons uh, combining literature and art. Mm. And the program was called Visual Literacy. And for the next eight to 10 years, I developed these art lessons with two other artists. And then we had a team that would take these lessons out to the schools. And we ended up servicing over 30,000 students. And this was primary schools? Mm -hmm. Wow. K through five. Does anything like that exist now? I don't Tucson? think so. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. And that was through the Tucson Museum of Art? That, that was, no, that was through uh, Tucson uh, Unified School District and um, opening my, OMA program, Opening Minds for the Arts. Mm. Uh, abruptly, that program was canceled. Mm. Uh, you know, right. art out, Right. right? Uh, but we got a new soccer coach in. <laughs> yeah, yippee. I mean, PE is important too, but it is not for every child. We should have the option for both. Absolutely. I mean, that's the key. Because, Without a doubt. You know, there's kids that are incredibly talented in sports, and they shouldn't be marginalized any more than art kids. But, you know, you need both because they're, right. they're not the same, you know. They're mind, mind and body. Yeah, gen generally they're different, you know, types of kids. Yeah. And... Um, so, I mean, you have to wonder those 10 years that you did it, if you could do a survey to find out of those kids that went through it, how many of them may have gone into the arts or creative program or something completely different, just like you were in the church and saw this and how it affected you. It may have, I'm sure there was kids that were affected completely for their whole entire life because of I, that. I actually know of a case. Okay. Tell me that. Um, I was walking through the mall maybe five years ago, and someone said, Mrs. Wagner. And this young girl came running up to me, and she said, do you remember me? And I said, oh, you look, you know, young, young grown-up woman now. Right. She said, you taught a lesson on Frank Lloyd Wright. Do you remember that lesson? Because, Mark, I didn't just talk about uh, blocks and uh, simple, basic elements of... of uh, art and design. 
I pushed it with these kids and we made plots of land with boxes and we laid, did city planning and this was in third grade. Mm. And she came up to me, I think her name was Caitlin. She said, I am in architecture school because of you. Wow, see, there it is. That meant the world to me yeah. because um, I know what my early experiences meant to me and to see, I could see it every day when I was teaching children the ones that I was reaching, the uh, the naive quality uh, that the innate way that they would make art reminded me of how I wanted to be all over again, mm. you know, mm -hmm. just free and unabandoned. And I didn't teach art as a teacher because I'm, I'm not, I don't have a teaching degree. I taught art as an artist. Right. Which is completely so different. <laughs> everybody's does not have to look the same. Right. How do you feel about yours? What do you want yours to mean? It was amazing. Um, and, and that story has been repeated several times with other students uh, that I have heard of over the years. That have also gone through that program that it changed their lives. That's correct. Yeah, I believe in that. I think that's really true. Yeah. And, and that's just the proof right there. When, mm. um, when my art program was canceled... One of the principals, uh, her name was Dr. Uh, Jan Vesley. She said, listen, I heard the program is canceled. I want you to come to my school, Peter Howell Elementary uh, in Tucson. She said, I don't have any art money, Shirley, but I've got so much money in science. Can you take the science curriculum and write an art curriculum? I said, absolutely. I, I love a challenge like yeah. that. Um, so, for example, uh, part of the curriculum, uh, fourth grade, is earth materials. Mm -hmm. Study of rocks, you know, metamorphosis, volcanoes. volcanoes. Um, I said, okay, we're going we're gonna to take the study of rocks, and I'm teaching these kids landscape art. And so we went outside in plein air, mm -hmm. and we're looking at the Catalinas, and we're talking about atmospheric perspective and how those mountains, look how blue they look. They're not really blue, but because of the atmosphere, they look blue. And that's why artists paint them that way. So I taught the children how to look and how to draw. And that program uh, went, what was amazing. As a matter of fact, it was nationally recognized and published uh, wow. because of the, uh, through the uh, Department of Education and the, uh, National Endowment for the Arts. It was actually uh, published. Uh, it was called Third Spaces When Learning Matters. And it's uh, the space between the viewer and the art and what happens in that space mm. when uh, you're allowed into that space. Yeah, and to, again, spend the time to look. And spend the time to look. <laughs> it comes back to that a lot, I think. Just always. I mean, we in this world we have this tendency to just walk by things, focus, tunnel vision, and we don't look at our environment. We don't look at the the ferial, those things that are just there for a second, but you have to observe, or the shadows, yes. or light, yes. or a bird flying by, mm. or the sounds that are going by you, mm. any of that stuff. And uh, I think if you can envelop and develop your art sensibilities then those things come to life for you and it changes the way we see things yes i think that's critically important to what you do Absolutely. in sculpture because yes. especially modern sculpture more contemporary since it takes a little effort on the viewer's part i think to look at the work and, and understand what the artist is trying to give back to you don't you think that's true absolutely yeah um and I like to build a little mystery into my work. I, I, uh, I like to engage the viewer, not with color, uh, but with form, mm -hmm. lights and shadows, patterns. Um, I like to watch people looking at my work. I bet. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Because they're, what they get may be different from what you uh, had wanted them to get, or maybe not. But, yes. you know, that's art, right? That's right. That's and so right. when did you learn to use the power tools? <laughs> so, uh, I didn't learn them in school. No one would teach me. So, 
I just went over to Home Depot one day and I, I uh, talked to this nice guy and, and I said, look, I want to start cutting my own wood. And he was very kind and uh, he said, okay, here's what you're going to start out <laughs> with, just a little miter saw. And you just, you know, hold that, see that little red button and you just push it and the, it'll, the wheel will start rolling and you just come down and then come. And, and so. What did he think you wanted to do? Did you tell him what it was for? You know, I tried to explain it to him and he couldn't understand it. Uh, so the next time I went in, I brought some pictures of the work because now I wanted other tools, et cetera. And he really got into he it got with into me. It. He got into it. Uh, it probably reminded him of his days in shop class. <laughs> that you, you know? didn't get. And I told him, look, I didn't get to have this now. So it's my turn. Yeah. And um, How old were you when you started doing this? Mark, I, I was... It wasn't until I was 50 years old yeah. that I really seriously started doing this work. I'm 70 years old. Yeah. But you got, because you had a family, right? I had a family. And you're doing these other things. It's not like you're not doing art. No, no. And, and, and listen, those years I worked in the public school system were some of the most creative years of my life because just watching again, watching children create sure. is, is almost me creating and visualizing how I would do it. Um, I, I did want to mention one thing. Why I left um, that that art program was to do my own work. But what really happened is that a parent came in and brought pieces of wood. And he goes, here, Mrs. Wagner, do you, would you like this for the class? And he said, do you want me to cut it up for you? Whatever. So he cut into the cubes, so similar to the cubes that I keep staring at right. behind you. Right. And so I taught the children uh, about Louise Nevelson, who is yeah. my idol. Yeah, yeah and, one of my favorites, by the way. Oh, and I believe it. When I look at your work, I see her work. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Did you ever see Dawn's wedding feast with all the white yes. wedding? Oh, yes. that's just amazing. <laughs> anyway, um, so I took some of that wood and I said, it's time for me to return to my work. So in the height of this amazing program. Was the wood talking to you, you think? It was so talking to yeah. me. Um, it was alive. Uh, I could make it into any shape I wanted. I could form it. I could bend it. I could steam it in place. I could paint it all one color. Um, and so my very beginning work was all monochromatic. All uh, And I, I started working very large from the very beginning five by five, six by six. Uh, I just had, I had waited so long uh, for my turn to step out right. that I didn't have time to just come onto the scene. I wanted, I was bursting to come on. And so I just had this affinity to work large, no problem. Now, how old were you at this point when you got this wood? Were you uh, 45, 50? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right in that about, time frame. Right about there, yeah. Yep. And so it was your it was your time to to it explore your time. creativity. Yes, Mark. It was. And what did your husband think about this? He was my biggest advocate. Yeah, nice. He was. Um, he said to me one time, Shirley, we would sit there and have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, and we'd look at a piece I just did. He said, "I feel like I won the lottery." Mm. By the way, the first piece I ever did was called Youngstown, Ohio. And why? It was a tribute to the steel mills of Youngstown, to the, everything was blue gray. And there were parts of town that you didn't go into because the air quality was so bad. Mm. Um, wow. A lot of health issues in Youngstown oh, uh, I'm sure. after that. Um, but, and there was a sameness, but People, was that a positive piece or not? It was. It's a very introspective piece. I would it, think it is. I'd love to show it to you. I I I own it because I couldn't part with this one. So it's very close to you. Then. Very close to me. Um, I look at it every day. Um, so it it started out with kind of a fuchsia. I airbrushed it. Well. I'll just very quickly tell you, I assembled it all with raw wood, cut shapes, uh, mostly geometric geometric shapes, um, four by four. After I constructed the piece, 
I airbrushed it with a dark fuchsia color. And then over the fuchsia, I uh, painted a warm gray. And so the life of the fuchsia wanted to come out and in parts it did, but there was a blanket of gray over it. Um, sort of subdued and unified it, mm -hmm. but it reminded me of the quality of uh, I experienced as a child. The air. The air. Yeah. You know, the people, suffocating air, the I'm suff sure. Listen, you know what people would say? Be glad that there's uh, soot in the air. That means the jobs. mills are running. Means jobs. Mm. Yeah. Wild. But I could understand that weirdness, you know, and... Where we lived, if you smelled the cattle lots, you could say that's money in the air. Yeah, that's right. You know, right. The smell of money is, I think, exactly what they would call yeah. it. So, you know, I, I, I can understand it. I mean, jobs are critically important as we live in a time right now where jobs are, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with jobs. That's right. You know? And uh, so I get it. I would like to have a picture of that piece, and I'll put it on the YouTube channel. I would with love this, it. we'll put it in with the interview. In fact, those who are watching <clears throat> this on YouTube, if you look over Shirley's side, you'll see one of her sculptures that she's working on right. now, yes. which is a piece that's being done. That's in styrofoam. That's going to be polystyrene. Polystyrene. That's mm -hmm. going to be turned into a bronze, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And so, when are you going to do that? We're skipping um, here, but I want to no, find out a little as bit. As soon as um, the foundries open, you know, given where we are right now in the right. world, waiting, but. Um, as soon as the foundry's open, we're going to 3D print it. Hmm. And um, I've always seen my work in bronze. And so will that be a polychrome? In other words, will you, how you have the silver round circle, will you have it just, look, it'll look like that in bronze? That's correct. It'll be at the silver disc in steel, uh, but the rest of the body will be in bronze. I see. So you'll yeah. add, you'll you'll manufacture the steel disc That's and then correct. apply it to it. That's correct. Yeah, that does have a Nevelson. Every time I look at that your work, I see the... Yeah. And it should be. A, I do. I like the black, actually. I do, too. Yeah. Uh, I, I like that piece. I call it Eclipse. Yeah, I get it. I see and, it. And the way the light comes across at certain times of day. You know, my, my work is, my work talks to you during the day yeah. because of the light and shadow and uh, it pulls you in. Yes. Uh, yeah. And certain parts of the day that that disc, that dome is halfway covered. So yeah. again, for those who are just listening to this, go to YouTube and you can check this out right. and see it too. And, yeah. and so you go and you start with this wood mm -hmm. and you go to Home Depot and That's somebody right. helps you and you start That's learning right. how to use the tools. That's right. And then you quit the program that you're working for and say, it's That's my right. time. That's right. And so how did, what did you do yeah. then? So um, I said, I, I, I love the experience and... Uh, so I started looking for wood in uh, all different kinds of places. Learning is, I'm a big researcher. So whatever I get into, I learn it in so depth, probably more than I need to, mm -hmm. but I'm fascinated with the field um, and the material. So before long, I was doing a whole bunch of um, work that was influenced by uh, aerial views, mm -hmm. uh, looking at Google Maps and, and plots and going on an airplane. I'd look out the window and see how how the land looked. And so my earliest work was all uh, pretty much uh, horizontal, vertical, grid-like, um, large. And then after about two years, and all monochromatic, after about two years, I wanted to become a little freer with wood, so I started experimenting with bended birch plywood. Mm, yeah, I like that. Yeah, and I would steam and bend it into place. And so now I'm almost painting with wood. And you've got that piece in the gallery, the purple one. Yeah, right. quintessential example of that. Just uh, And I call that series organics. Um, very hard to uh, produce. Very delicate. Uh, and time-consuming? Very time-consuming. Uh, because now I'm using uh, pneumatic pins and very sophisticated ways of, of adhering the work together. But oftentimes I just had to sit there and hold a piece. There was no other way. I couldn't clamp it. I couldn't nail it. I had to glue it and I just had to hold it in place for 20, 30 minutes until it sort of held and, and I could move on. Um, 
So then I started thinking about old wood, aged wood. Um, vintage. Vintage wood. Wood that had a story. Mm -hmm. Long before it came into my hands. Where it had been. How uh, I, I found some amazing um, the wood that you find in the ocean. The Right, driftwood. Driftwood. Um, and all those little holes. And I learned how the little pebbles get into those holes and just go round, 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 round. And they just carve out those little right. uh, holes all over. And then little creatures get in there, what have you. So I, I started a series called Ancient Fragments. And it was uh, pieces of wood left in their natural state, but bringing them into a, a contemporary composition uh, where it was ancient and modern and, and the juxtaposition of the both and the dialogue of those two kinds of pieces getting together. And um, Do you like Deborah Butterfield's work? Who does the horses out of the wood? Yes, I do like her work. Yeah, yeah. I do too. Um, I love all those those curved right. shapes. That she, yeah, yeah. But yours the, in, this, in this Driftwood series were um, more in a modern bent again. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, had some African influence to them. I got into some long, narrow pieces, totem, totem-like, and um, I stayed with that for a while. It was, it was a very, uh, very popular series for me. Um, and so you have a. Let's say you have something like that where it is popular and sells and does well. Is there a part of you go? Maybe I should revisit that because. I mean, just from the point that it's sold mm. commercially, or as an artist, you go, did that, done that, Kinda. I'm moving on. Yeah. yeah, That's hard. That's hard for artists to go back and do more of uh, what you did well at, because if you just keep doing what you've done, you sort of feed your ego. Mm. Oh, that felt good. Mm -hmm. I'll do some more like that. You don't grow as an artist mm. that way, you know? You grow by uh, pushing, experimenting. A lot of my time is spent just playing. Just go to my studio and play. Just have stuff all over the place, so much stuff, and just see what looks good today. I remember Pablo Picasso, uh, one of his wives, had a cleaning girl go into his studio, you may know the story, and cleaned up his studio, and he just went crazy because he couldn't create. He had a block, and I understand that. <laughs> I've, got, I've got to create... Uh, order from chaos. Yeah. I got to have lots of stuff around me. Yeah, I understand to, that very yeah, well. Totally. I mean, totally. you've seen the back of my yes. office. Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, <laughs> is rather, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a pile, but it's my pile. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, so it's tempting to go back. Sometimes um, I go back to revisit and I critique myself and I, I've taken pieces apart and put them into new work. And uh, that's gratifying because that, I feel now I've, I've moved the work forward. But to, to go back, uh, you know, I've had people say, oh, I just love this one series I did with these little small boxes, et cetera. I just love that. But no, I, no. And now with COVID and um, making you look at your life, all of us looking at right. our lives as an artist, you know, what mark do I want to make? What do I want to say? What do I want to leave behind? Right. And uh, it's not more of the same. It's uh, it's a chronology of work, a body of work that grows and moves forward. And so you've been doing now 20 years as an artist. Yes. And you show up my gallery. You've showed at lots of different places, mm -hmm. you know, museum shows and collections. Yes. And But you had trauma in your own life, too, that you had to get through. I don't know if yes, you want to I talk do. about that I'd or not. I'd be happy to. But yeah, I mean, you know, you, you were married for how long? I was married to my husband, Marius, for 37 years. Yes. And uh, we were in India in 2014 on the Ganges River. It was um, Diwali, the uh, a, a special festival that celebrates uh, women celebrating their sons. Forgive me, I believe that's what it that's the proper description of the festival. Anyway, we were on the Ganges in a small boat. My husband had a seizure. Mm. And uh to make a long story short, he uh 
he was diagnosed with glioblastoma, which is uh, brain. brain cancer, uh, what John McCain had. Uh, suddenly, glioblastoma is a word that we hear a lot more. Mm-hmm. And um, Yeah, it's an aggressive cancer of the brain. Very much so. Yeah. To this day, I've never looked. I've never Googled the word. Yeah. My sister said, "Don't." <laughs> you know, life expectancy was, you know, I guess, a couple months. Anyway, he lived three and a half years. Yes. Um. But. Did you make art during that time frame? Yes. Good. Yeah, I would think it, it would be a way to, to just survive. Really. It's the only way I could get through it, Mark. Um, just as when I taught art to children and I felt like there were some children I was doing art therapy with, mm. I was now doing therapy on myself. Had to do art. Either I did it or I was thinking about doing it or I was looking around the hospital and mm. think, finding inspiration. Yeah, I could see that. And You're uh, spending all those hours, again, looking... And a lot of it's just contemplative. Yes. You were back in church. I was back in church. Yeah. So at part of his treatment, he had to have a mask made out of uh, a plastic material that's perforated. And uh, the mask would be custom fit to his face and an upper torso, and it would be used for uh, radiation therapy. Mm. And I, uh, I've written a lot about this. It's amazing. Anyway, the technicians got this sheet of plastic. It was large, like a poster board size, and immersed it in warm water and put it on his face. And within just a minute, it hardened into the most eerie and amazing likeness of his face mm. and for in the middle of all of this chaos and and trauma for my, myself and for my husband i said to myself that is the coolest material <laughs> i had ever seen it's sculpture yes yeah all over again yeah and i said stop no yeah. no don't, don't go there don't yeah. go there yeah let's get through this yeah but my husband and i talked about uh, how I felt about that material. And when he was done with his treatment, he came out of the room with that mask in his hand. And he said, now you do something with this. Mm. He handed it over to me. And so um, we continued with his therapy. And maybe... He lived three and a half more years, even though the, I guess the diagnosis was, you know, he could have just lived a few months. Yeah, it's a bad diagnosis. Yeah. He lived three and a half years. And so he got to see me finally take that mask and do something with it. I looked at that mask. I kept saying, what can I do to it? How can, what can I add to this? Because I'm an assemblage. I'm always adding something. Right. And I took the mask uh, into the house because I didn't have any mirrors in my studio. But I took the mask finally into the house and I went into the bathroom and I put the, looked at myself in the mirror and I took the mask and I put the mask over my face and I could see my eyes and the details of my face through this mask. And I said, Shirley, it's not about the mask. It's about the person behind the mask. It's about the humanity in all of us. Mm -hmm. And there again, it's this layering thing again. The mask, my face, the human psyche, emotion, you know, how deep do you want to go? Right. And um, I created a, an installation that was seven feet long and I took his mask along with six masks of other patients because now I've got uh, the technicians at the hospital 
saying, Shirley, do you want more masks? Got it. Yeah, it makes sense. They don't want to just throw it away. They see that it has a purpose of life, right. a repurpose. Some people, some patients wanted their masks, but many of them yeah, didn't I'm want sure. to deal with it. Yeah, I'm sure. So I took those masks and I took images of people. Uh, and I, I don't want to go into detail who they were right. just out of because of the privacy of that. But I, I reproduced images of seven people on a clear um, plastic film. Uh, how can I explain this? I got a box and I put LED lights inside the box. It illuminated the whole box. Mm -hmm. And the box was seven feet long by about five feet, five inches deep. On top of the box, I laid this film with seven faces, just floating in a clear film, seven clear life-size faces. And then on top of the film, I put seven masks. Mm. And so illuminated, at first, all you see is the mask. But when you look just for one second, suddenly the face eerily comes through the mask mm. and you lose the focus on the mask and you look into the person. The name of that installation was You Are Not a Statistic, You Are a Person. And I, uh, I dedicate that mask project to my husband's neurosurgeon, Dr. Tom Norton, because he's the one that said to me, Shirley, remember, your husband is not a statistic. He is a person. And that piece... Um, has been promised to uh, the Ivy Brain Center, uh, part of Barrow's Neuroscience Center up in Phoenix. Mm. And it will be installed in an auditorium uh, where artists and scientists, uh, or scientists come together to, uh, in symposium style to uh, discuss glioblastoma and to discuss all the brain cancers. And my idea was to bring art into that arena Right. And force this dialogue of art and science, you know, just like just like researchers now are trying to find a cure for COVID. Right. Right. They're, they're scientists. But they're trying to come up with some sort of abstract. Artists take abstracts and try to bring them into some tangible reality. So art and science we're in this thing together. Well, I, yeah. think I'm of, so crazy about that concept. Well, just think about the COVID virus, right? Right. When you think about it, all you see immediately is a three-dimensional image of the virus with yes. these little appendages coming out in red and all, you know, I mean, it's all sculpture. Everything you think about the way they present it is always sculpture, which is, and I, there's no doubt in my mind, it's already being done, that people are using that imagery yeah, sure. to turn it into art. You know, the expressions of what this thing is doing. There'll be major installations, I'm sure, Absolutely. built out of those little, yeah. you know, sculpture. I've even thought about that. I mean, you know, yeah. and I'm just an art dealer. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it makes my mind want to go there too and say, mm -hmm. you know, what can be done and what, you know, to express this. And just like your masks, you know, there's a, I mean, maybe you want to even investigate it yourself. Who knows? I mean, it's something that's affecting the world. It's that's a right. world that's thing, right. not just a local no, thing. No, no, and artists respond to they everything do. in the world. Yes. Of course, of course. Yes, they do. So, and then, so he passes away three years ago? Three years ago. Yes. Last week, or last Sunday, yeah. And, uh, yeah, but you as an artist have continued to flourish and in some weird way, it seems like that has giving you the opportunity yeah. to open a new window and, you know, you're producing great work. You're doing this jewelry, like the, what you have on, yeah. which is sculptural and, you know, Calder-esque in my sense of how yes. Calder would do his thing. And so what's that been like these last three years? Well, I've, d I've been doing art therapy on myself yeah. for, th I've been doing art therapy on myself for three years. My husband um, was a real fighter. And two weeks after brain surgery, we walked a two-mile loop 
and he still had this bandage around his head. Right. You know, I mean, he looked like Frankenstein. <laughs> he was a big guy. And he goes, you don't understand. I said, Marius, we're not going to go for a walk. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. I have to do this. And so I, after his passing, I have to do this. Right. He left a lot of his hard work ethic and his determination to fight adversity. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm doing what he wanted me to do. And don't forget, I have three kids that are watching their mother like a hawk. Mm. Three sons that want to know mom is doing okay. I am in my studio every day. And uh, some days, I, you know, a lot of days, there's nothing coming out of it. Okay? <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's just the way it is. Yeah. That's, it's part of the process. But um, I've gotten very much into the research of work and learning all of and the history of, 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 I might just pick a subject and just start studying about it and just go deep, deep, deep into it. Um, but I decided to uh, leave wood and move into uh, polystyrene as this piece you see here, this is just one of the few examples um, where I could move out into the coming out at you and moving off the picture plane. And so I'm ex I've been working uh, a lot with that. And once the foundries open up, I'll be working, uh, working in bronze. The pieces will all be wall hangings. Um, Are you going to have them all wall hangings or will some be freestanding? Or do you know? Um, right now, wall but I've entertained three-dimensional. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. It's but just... the polystyrene gives me lots of freedom to do that. You take a, a, a sheet of that blue, you yes. know, the stuff that's used in building, mm -hmm. and you take a hot knife that gets to, I don't know, 2,000 degrees or something crazy, and you just cut it like butter, mm -hmm. like the softest of butter, and you can just turn that stuff around. It's very freeing. Could never use a, a power tool, a uh, miter saw to do anything like that. So this is giving me lots of freedom to move out into the plane and, uh, you know, see where that takes me. And that's what it's all about, right? That's I right. Guess. That's right. You know, create and see where it takes you. And, and then getting exposure, too, I think must be yeah. gratifying to some part of your brain, too. Very much so. I mean, artists all need that little pat on the back that we're doing so. well. I think so. Yeah. For the most part, I do, because you wonder if you're reaching anybody. Yeah. And, you know, making a sale while the money is needed and, and, and sometimes very nice. But it, there's also something I would think about the fact that somebody else gets what you do. That's right. And you, you start to think about your mark in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to live forever, forever, but your art can. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that's where that's where my head is right now. Yeah. yeah. Well, to me, and that means spending time and trying to get things in museums as well. That's right. Which I could see your work easily in lots of museums mm. because it has that sensibility of uniqueness, mm -hmm. which is what, again, I look for so much in an artist is, does this speak to me? I mean, I'm, I'm a Nevelson fan. I love Nevelson, mm -hmm. but you don't do Nevelson. It's your interpretation of the world and how you see it. And that's what I'm looking for that's right. is somebody who has that. And it's not only can you present it, but do you have the chops to be able to do it? That's that's true. It's one thing to visualize it. It's another thing to try to bring it to fruition and all the uh, disappointment along the way, all the all the pieces that didn't work. Right. You know, that no one has ever seen. It's it's hard. It's but I wouldn't do it any other way. I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> Have you ever thought about doing a church, you know, line from when that mm -hmm. inspiration was? It'd be very interesting for you to go back and go into that church again. Well, it's interesting because for about the last two weeks, I've been listening to Gregorian chants. Oh, ah, there you go. And uh, just thinking about the sights and sounds as a child and what I experienced. Uh, I don't know. We're going to see where that all comes out in, in my work. You know, these things, they just don't come. They kind of stir around. That's right. And, you know, years, they sit there and percolate, and all of a sudden, you've got this moment, you know, and, and 
it looks so easy to everyone else, but you know that it's been years in coming. Right. And observing. And observing. Yeah. And I do that in my writing sometimes. Yes. A book will sit there for a few years. You know, and you just think about it and little pieces come in there and you just, and then one day you go, okay, I'm ready to write this. And it just I, all kind of flows out. Yeah. Or how about that one moment when something rushes in and that was it? You've just resolved it. Yeah. Oh, that happens. That's, right. yeah, that's, that's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> yeah. So what would you give advice to other artists? Because you've had quite the journey. You know, you had to do it in a circuitous way. Yes. You couldn't do it how you really wanted to do it, maybe, mm -hmm. but you had it, it unfolded as it is. What would you say to artists out there, maybe younger and older? That are trying to make it? Yeah. Oh, boy. It's, it sure looks like an exciting field, and, and it is. If the personal journey is an amazing experience for me, um, selling it and trying to get it out there, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, but I understand when this is where your heart is and this is what you want to be doing. Um, I would, I guess with the internet, it's a lot easier to get the work out there, to contact uh, galleries, clients, what have you. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about the work. It, and I, I couldn't live my life another way, Mark. I, I, uh, this it's, is how I see my world. It's how it drives you. It's how I drive it, how I, it drives me. So th there are sacrifices that you have to make if you choose this kind of a, of a life because it's not as uh, financially rewarding as you think it might be. Right. And, uh, but it's quantity versus quality. What kind of, you know, what kind of life do you really want to live? How many people say to me, oh, I, you know, I used to draw, and right. blah, blah, blah. Or I wanted to be an artist. Yeah. And somebody told me this and that. I didn't, she hurt my feelings. I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, it's tough. None of my children went into art. Um, I get that question you now. Are any of your children artists? No, but I did teach them how to look at the world in a creative way. And I taught them how to problem solve in a creative way. And they're all excellent at looking at a situation and saying, nah, it's not, let's try it this way, you know. So that's a gift. And um, so my art does spill out into the real world. And, yeah. and, um, oh, it already you know, has. Yeah. Just ask the architect. That uh, yeah. took your Frank Lloyd Wright that's right. class. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, she's going to make something. Yeah. Who she knows? Is. She may make something you end up living in or yeah. visiting. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so for all those artists out there, keep creating. Don't give up. Mm -hmm. And if you, if that's all you can do, I think if it's like eating or breathing, making art, if that falls into your milieu of who you are, then you got to do it. You know, and if you don't, then I think you're cutting yourself short. You are. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't have done it any other way. And maybe the sequence of events in my life and the way things happened, maybe it, it developed concentrated periods of pent up energy. And then it just flowed. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'll take it. And I guarantee you, your mother would be thrilled. Thrilled beyond belief. Beyond belief. <laughs> she would be. Well, Shirley, it's wonderful having you as an artist in my gallery. I love your work. I love your jewelry. I'm looking forward to seeing your bronzes when they get done. And, uh, you know, we'll just keep creating. I'll keep doing my podcast. You keep creating. It sounds like a yeah. good plan. Shirley Wagner, Art Dealer Diaries. Thank you for taking the time during a uh, difficult time in America's yeah. you know, history. But for those who are creating, then you're still on track. Yeah. yeah. Great. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. No, that was, that was great.
We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon. Thank <laughs> you.